Hello, this is Drew Collins, Rector of St. Andrew's Anglican Church in Savannah, Georgia. Today is the 7th day of August, and it is the uh, the 8th Sunday after uh, Trinity. But we will also, we are observing today the Feast of the Transfiguration, which actually was yesterday. So I would invite you now to pray with me the collect appointed for the Transfiguration, followed by the collect for the 8th Sunday after Trinity. Let us pray. O God, who on the mount didst reveal to chosen witnesses thine only begotten Son, wonderfully transfigured in raiment, raiment white and glistering, mercifully grant that we, being delivered from the disquietude of this world, may be permitted to behold the King in his beauty, who with thee, O Father, and thee, O Holy Ghost, liveth and reigneth one God, world without end. Amen. O God, whose never-failing providence ordereth all things both in heaven and earth, we humbly beseech thee to put away from us all hurtful things, and to give us those things which are profitable for us, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Here beginneth the thirteenth verse of the first chapter of the second epistle of St. Peter. I think it right, as long as I am in the body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort, so that after my departing you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for when he received honor and glory from God the, God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by maje the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice, voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day... Here in, uh, excuse me, <laughs> with him on the holy mountain. I actually read a little bit too far. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And I apologize for that. Well, in this text, the epistle appointed for today, uh, and we will touch on the gospel appointed for transfiguration as well, but in this text, uh, St. Peter writes to them knowing that his time in this life is short, but he is determined to make full use of it. He is determined, uh, as I often say, my goal is to uh, to wear out rather than rust out. Uh, just this week I read of a lady who is 99 years old and still goes to work every day at Chick-fil-A. Now, I don't know if Chick-fil-A will be in my future uh, if I reach the age of 99, but if I'm in good health, I hope to still be doing something and staying active. Uh, one of the th I've sometimes said that one of the things I like about ministry is that if one lives long enough and is still healthy, uh, one can always, if nothing else, find a church that is more than happy for you to do visitation a couple of days a week to stay useful. Well, St. Peter is writing from a different perspective. He is not that old. But he is determined to make full use of whatever time he has left. And so he writes this to, his, to the recipients of this letter. And he wants to stir up this up to them by way of reminder. He also wants to remind them of the truth of the gospel, knowing that he will not be with them. The time is coming when he will not be with them. And so he wants to, to have it in their minds, he wants them to, to, to remember uh, the truths of the gospel and to be convinced of the truths of the gospel because there will come those times when it, is, uh, when it is possible to doubt, when it is easy to doubt. And so it is that he makes reference to the time that is coming when the putting off of his body will be soon as the Lord made clear to him. Now the word that is used there, the putting off the body. Actually, in the uh, King James, it's the tabernacle. 
Uh, but the word used, uh, the word in Greek is actually uh, skinoma, an encampment, a tabernacle. It's something that has temporary use. The tabernacle uh, was not intended to be a permanent building. The tabernacle was in use for a time. It could be put up, it could be taken down, but the tabernacle did not last forever. And so he writes, being aware that he will soon put off his body, and all of us will one day uh, put off our bodies. Now, one of the things that has been somewhat frustrating in modern society is I hear people say, well, that's just a shell. Uh, that's just an empty shell. No, the body is to be treated with respect. Because, as Christians, we believe that one day the body will be resurrected and glorified before God for the believer at the, at the general resurrection at the last day. But Peter knows that his time is, is short. He remembers what Jesus told him about how he would die. He said, when you were young, you used to dress yourself, uh, excuse me, in second uh, or in, in John 21 18 truly truly I say to you when you were young you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted but when you were old you were stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go and Jesus told him this we are the scripture tells us because he wanted to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God and after that, Jesus says, follow me. And indeed, by tradition, Peter did die a martyr's death. On a cross, in fact. His arms were stretched out. He was carried where he did not want to go, crucified uh, on, an, on an inverted cross uh, by tradition at Rome. And the interesting thing is, and I may have noticed that, noted this before, uh, for years it was thought that Peter was martyred at Rome and that he was buried under what is now the Sistine Chapel. And some years ago they were doing an excavation there and lo and behold they found uh, skeletal remains of a body that had undergone crucifixion and as best they could determine was from the first century AD. So it appears that that tradition uh, while not an article of faith, if, if it were to be disproved, it would not shatter my faith in any in any way. But it appears that that is where, that is indeed St. Peter, and those are his remains. But Jesus had told him that he would suffer a martyr's death, and, and he knows this. And so he wants to make every effort so that after his departure... They would be able at any time to recall these things. He wanted it seared into their memory. He did not want them to forget because he knows that it is all too easy for us as human beings to forget. We need to be reminded. That's why we celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper. That's why we need to constantly be uh, uh, or repeatedly be hearing the words of God and reading the words of God and taking them to heart and inwardly digesting them. And then he notes, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of the majesty. These are not fables that St. Peter is referring to. These are not myths. These are not cleverly devised stories. Rather, he is referring to things that he saw himself. And he speaks uh, also of that which would be the coming. It makes reference to the second advent, to Christ's return in glory at the end of the age. Now, it's interesting that uh, some people doubt the authorship of uh, St. Peter, uh, of at least the second epistle of Peter. They say, well, someone else must have written this down. Well, if you note there, 
St. Peter makes reference to himself as an eyewitness of Christ's majesty, which leads me to believe that, uh, at least taking it at face value, I don't think St. Peter was making this up. I think St. Peter really did write this. He gives evidence of, uh, or, this, or this letter bears witness of being written by exactly who it says wrote it in that he was an eyewitness to Christ's majesty. They remembered when Christ received uh, honor and glory from God and the glory was born to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And he notes, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Again, referring in first person to what happened on the holy mountain, what happened at the transfiguration. Of course, that is the gospel text appointed for transfiguration. When Peter and, ja Peter and John and James go up with Christ on the mountain to pray, and as they're praying, uh, the appearance of his face is altered and his clothing became, the ESV says, dazzling white in the King James's uh, white and glistering. And then on the cross they see these two men talking to him, Moses and Elijah bearing witness to Christ, the law and the prophets bearing witness to who Jesus was and the power of Jesus. And that is a mighty thing indeed. And they wait, and his disciples um, had fallen asleep. But then, when they wake up, when they come to, they see this this image, and they they enjoy being there on the mountain. It is a wonderful experience for them. In fact, they want to build uh, tents: one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And then a cloud comes upon them. And we discussed a few weeks ago how generally in Scripture are, clouds are often associated with a, a manifestation of God's presence. And this cloud comes upon them and they hear, This is my Son, my Chosen One, listen to him, bearing witness to who Jesus was. And so... St. Peter wants his, his readers to know and he wants us to know that we may trust in who Jesus said he was and who Jesus is because of that experience that he had, because he wrote of that which he was an eyewit to which he was an eyewitness, to which he had seen with his own eyes, which he had experienced himself. And then later on in the, in the chapter, it was not in the epistle appointed for today, I inadvertently began to read part of it. He said, we have something much more sure, or something more sure, the prophetic word which you will do well to pay attention as, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, knowing this, that no scripture, for, uh, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation because no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In this passage, in this epistle, St. Peter bears witness to the authenticity of what he had seen, to the authenticity of who Jesus was, and he did so based not only on his own experience, which was certainly powerful, and that which he had seen and heard and, and experienced, but he does so based upon God's word, referring to the prophetic witness of Jesus. St. Peter was sure of who Jesus was, and we can be sure of who Jesus is because of God's reliable word, that men didn't just write cunningly devised fables, they ju did not just tell interesting stories, but rather they wrote as they were inspired by God. 
And as they were inspired by God, they wrote the Holy Scriptures. Thanks be to God for his prophetic word. Thanks be to God for the trustworthy witness that is found to Jesus in God's word. And thanks be to God, certainly, for the great work done by our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom the law and the prophets testified, to whom the very voice of God acclaimed. And for that we may say, thanks be to God. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Amen.